What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Sales Remastered. My name is Daniel, and I'm your host. And in this episode, we're going to talk about negotiations, the importance of knowing how to negotiate and effectively close somebody on purchasing right then and there. Let me show you everything I know. So this video is going to be very helpful for you if you have right now, especially with with the way the market is and and how widespread your competitors are. Like, I mean, the ease of of getting a competitive quote from one of your competitors has not has never been as easy as it is today. And so I think it's important to share with my community and share with you. You know, at some point in time, you're going to come up to a pitch or an engagement where you have to negotiate, right? It's it's very rare that we engage with a consumer or a prospect um, that's just ready to buy at the price, no questions asked, no discounts or rebates or incentives needed, just give me the product. But, you know, it, it brings up a very interesting fact. And I was just thinking about how popular sales are. Like, did you know that most of um, acquisitions or most of purchases are taken um, because there's a perceived discount or a perceived, um, uh, how can I put it, sale that will expire. And so this this influences urgency because you don't want to miss out. It's that FOMO effect that marketing does. It's, uh, you know, have you ever bought something that says, hey, sale ends this weekend? Or have you ever bought something within a special event sale, like launch sale or Labor Day weekend sale? You know, this is why you see a lot of advertising going going on about summer sale, right? There's all these sales that ultimately capture your attention and one of the primary purposes of, of even doing that sale is because the likelihood of that consumer or purchaser purchasing other things or buying in other things is is much more likely. It's kind of like a, a matinee, right? Like if you have a movie theater by you and maybe they have a matinee special, most particularly during the summer. So like during you know the day you could you could purchase or, or at least buy movie tickets for a dollar rather than pay 15 plus dollars in the evening or you know like in the weekend and do you want to know why that's effective is because consumers at least those who don't try to sneak in the snacks in their bag <laughs> you know you sneaking your shit in your bag it's okay but I do the same thing but it, it will ultimately attract consumers to buy the one dollar ticket and then the company is now relying on the on the likelihood of them buying snacks from the snack bar with higher margins right and so there's kind of a sacrifice But nonetheless, the organization doing the sale is winning. They're always winning. You know, it's like that saying in Vegas, the house always wins, even though you believe that you're ahead or you believe that you're winning. In all reality, the house is is more than likely going to win all that money back. But anyway, going back to negotiations, you know, you know, probably by now already, I'm I'm obviously in sales. The channel is called Sales Remastered. And um, negotiations, though, has been part of my life since day one, even before I became a professional salesman and today i think that it's more relevant because we're in a changing market we're in a shifting market you know if you're like me and you you rely on sales that are based on you know the interest rates or the economy or the strength of the economy and your your price is determined on factors that you cannot control the the best way to combat that and still prevail and still win and still thrive like nothing, you know, like nothing's ever happened. Um, whereas most in your circle, in your community, or, or you're surrounded by are feeling the effects of a rising market or they're feeling the effects of an increased price. Do you want to know how the winners win? And it's almost like they didn't even get the memo that the, the price or the rates are up. This is how I'm going to share this with you. So be sure to watch the video all the way through. And I ask you a favor if this is your first time, you know, checking out the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit that bell so that way you're notified of any topics that do come up in the future. But I'm going to start something new and I'm going to ask my community and those that watch to timestamp in the comments below, timestamp 
a section within the video, not only this video, but videos coming coming forward or videos that you might see, you know, as you go through the history and collection of my videos, but timestamp. And ultimately what that does is basically you're you're commenting the exact time. So if you like the video at three minutes and 45 seconds, then your comment would be three colon 45. And then, and then if you want, you know, if you like put a memo as to why you thought it was uh, important and why you, why it really stood out. And what that does is it helps the community identify where in the video is probably the most capturing information. But, you know, I invite you to do that because I'm seeing a lot of engagement now in the videos and those who timestamp get the most engagement because then, then it opens up the dialogue and like, okay, well, you know, you took that away from that information, but this is what I took away. And I think that the community communicating with each other builds not only a stronger community, but more clarity. And it also shares the message in a whole new different way when you get to kind of you know, see the information or at least read how the information was perceived from a different set of eyes. And so in this video, you're going to see how negotiations is is viewed by the different set of eyes, which is on the other side of the negotiation table, that being the, the pair of your prospect or your consumer. And so when we get into a position where, um, number one, when we go into a pitch, what I what I want you to take a step back and kind of watch any process that you have in place right now, watch it. Watch it from a third party looking in and really think about the process because you probably have gone through the process enough times where you understand the basic layout of how the sequence of, you know, occurs from the very opening. The opening is, is super important um, because, I, I, and I'll give you an example, and why the opening is important is because it typically opens the dialogue and sets the engagement. It sets the tone of the engagement and the message. And so in this example, I'm going to give you, um, you know, like, let's say you're going in for a sales pitch and you have all the details ready from the prospect to where you have a good idea of what they will buy and what they won't buy. And what I can tell you is very common is that most salesmen actually approach it in this way. So for example, if you, let's say your price was a thousand dollars, right? And you have total settlement services or closing costs that adds another, let's say two grand. And so your total cost for the transaction was $3,000 in this example, right? And, and because of the the information you gathered within the first conversation or at least the the interview call you're more than likely going to find out that your prospect will likely buy at this price they won't buy at this price or you've got a good feeling that if you only got this price then you can make a sale real fast and so you see the upside and and don't fret i mean you know this happens all the time with salespeople. So don't think like, oh man, I thought I was the only one who wanted free service, right? Although I can tell you most salesmen, they go into a pitch just believing that, just saying, hey man, if I can get you know enough of an exception to where this prospect doesn't pay a dime for the service, I think I could sell them, boss. <laughs> man, if you can't sell something for free, if you can't sell free service, then that, that's, some, that's a whole nother video. And but what I can do is at least give you a summary as to why you believe this way. And so number one is is it has to go it has a lot to do with your experience. It has a lot to do with the uh, pitches that you've you've had experience with. And so you may have gone through like um, let's say a set of, of pitches where every single person is asking for free service, right? Does that sound like a common question? Like what is this cost going to be for me? Your competitor said they don't charge anything. And then there's this misconception that the consumer has that the that that op, that businesses operate for free. So it'd be like, well, what's the lender charge? Well, what's the escrow company charge? Why is this company advertising no fees? And and sometimes you have to position yourself as as an educator rather than a salesman, right? So for example, like an like a salesman is going to respond back like, oh yeah, they're probably lying. You know, they probably can't cover all the costs. That, that, that's just an advertisement that they're going to change it on you in the process. Whereas an educator will actually come in giving information that's logical and the prospect will um, have no choice but to accept. 
And so it's, 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 it's very important on the tonality you use to deliver that information because, again, if you're going through, let's say, a, a bad streak, right? And I've gone through bad streaks plenty of times. I've recently gone through a bad streak. But it, it should not phase you, nor should it carry over into your next engagement. And you know it's carrying over into your next engagement because your prospects or even those around you who hear you um, think that you're arguing, right? Like uh, you don't got to get mad or man, that was aggressive. And what's happening is is we're actually using that. Have you ever uh, tick out you know, anger on someone who just didn't deserve it and then you feel bad afterwards? Well, ultimately, that's very similar to a pitch, right? Like we might have gone through an experience with this particular prospect before or pitch before where they just didn't want to buy and we it made complete sense and so we get upset and angry and it's it somehow our brain anchors it to um, a sound, right? Like so that sound could very well have been a question like, well, what's your fee? That in itself will trigger that emotion that you've just had with that last pitch or that that one pitch where it just didn't go right. And so then that anger, that frustration comes out and you start breathing heavy. You start becoming very short with your answers. You start um, coming off defensive. And there's one thing that I could tell you is absolutely certain is that conflict or resistance or 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 being argumentative is never going to end up with an agreement. It's never going to end up with a say. I've never been argumentative with a prospect where they're just like, all right, Daniel, man, you made a ton of sense here, let me buy. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's important that when you catch yourself being argumentative inside your negotiation or inside your pitch, that you, you really, really have to detach from the situation and remind yourself that there was a lot of work that was put into getting to that point. And you have a choice, you could, you could sacrifice all that time that got you up to that point just for the temporary relief of saying, yeah, I, I showed him or I showed her. But who really won, right? Who really won if that prospect didn't buy from you? I believe they won because number one, they saved themselves from engaging with a headache which would have, which ultimately was us because we're taking our frustration out on them. But number two is that they also, and I'm saying they as the prospects and the consumers, they also have anchors. They have anchors to to read tones, to read body language, to um, to remember certain questions that that trigger their memory to believe that they need to be in a state of protection, like they need to protect themselves. And consumers and, and humans in general protect the things that they love. And so there are there are a few things that people love, but one thing that that a person primarily loves when engaging with a business is their is their status, and their status is closely related to their money. And so if you if you think about it, prospects and and, and consumers, when they ask about the price, they're not asking about the price just because of the protection of money. They're asking about the price to protect their status because they don't want to be a sucker. They don't want to be taken advantage of. Again, they're reacting based off the memory that they've had with engaging with people like us, like salesmen, like businesses. And so what do you do? What do you do when you come across a situation where you know you have a prospect and you know you charge $3,000 in your total service transaction, right? And this is just an example. Of course, it's gonna depend on your company, it's gonna depend on the state that you're doing business in, it's gonna depend on your vendors, but nonetheless, I'm gonna use a roundabout figure, and I think $3,000 hits the spot. But let's say three thousand dollars was your was your settlement services, and and that's everything combined just for the prospect to get your service. And of that three thousand, maybe maybe a thousand dollars was your your fee, the lender fee, for example. And after speaking with this prospect, let's call him Jim. Jim el kept eluding to the fact, but yeah, what's your cost? What's your cost? And you did a great job with with overcoming that objection and, and bringing Jim closer towards the end, which is a high five in itself because a lot of salesmen, average salesmen, they can't they can't do that. You know, they hear certain questions like, well, what's your cost? And they fold. And they fold because they're triggered also based on the reaction or experience from the reaction that they had when they last engage in that type of uh, situation or scenario. And so maybe they folded because they were scared or maybe they folded because last time that happened they failed and so they panic. 
and then they begin to give out too much information or they they are not craftfully thinking of how to of how to manufacture the sentence and the wordplay they're not considerate on how the message will come across nor are they empathetic on how the prospect will will perceive and, and, and process the data of that message. And so going back to this situation, let's say we have a settlement service for Jim and or a service for Jim and we charge $3,000 for our service. And we're asking for an exception because clearly Jim's not going to want to pay $3,000. He told you. And so you go to your manager and, and or you go to your pricing manager or whoever is in charge of the exceptions and you ask, for three thousand dollars in credits, right? Number one is is when you when you when you ask for a specific exception, some salesmen will will ask for above and beyond than they need because they are expecting to come back lower. And so even if they come back lower, then hopefully it's close to what they they originally thought that they could sell. But that mindset is very very important, and that's ultimately where it stems from, where it roots from. It's what you believe you can sell. And so I want you to consider a few things the next time you ask for an exception because with changing times, you're not always going to get what you ask for. And so even if I had, let's say, a, a deal where I'm asking for an exception of $3,000 and let's say I got an approval for $1,000, which just happens to be my fee but not the fee of the outside vendors like title, escrow, notary, appraisal and all that good stuff. Um, and it might be different, of course, in the service that you provide. But let's say I got an exception and finally it came back a thousand. So of the three that I asked for, I got a thousand dollars back. This is ultimately where it starts. And when I say it, I'm talking about the momentum of the or the likelihood of you getting that sale to begin with. And so when you get the response back and it says, hey, I can only give you a thousand dollars, the the way you react to that is almost the entire uh, uh, hack in itself. And so if you react and say, oh man, I only got a thousand out of the three, he's not going to buy that. You're clearly headed in one direction. But if you receive it and you, you think, okay, no worries. I could sell that. Right. Or, or yeah, no, I'll make it work. That will veer you in a completely different direction. And that, that different direction is ultimately where you want to go is because you're using your creativity. You're thinking outside the box. You're not thinking in a limit from a limited state of mind where you believe that, oh, because you didn't get the full $3,000 in credit to make this service free, then this prospect isn't going to buy. Number one, you don't buy things that are free. You're given things that are free. Does that make sense? And so the prospect might just feel entitled that you give them stuff for free. And sometimes they feel entitled because their income or because of their credit or because of their payment history. Whatever the reason is, let that prospect believe that, but understand it and use it for your leverage. And so if I came came into a situation where I was only given a thousand of the three that I asked for, the the common reaction that I hear or the 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 way it's delivered through salesmen is like this. It says, Hey Jim, you know, I talked to my manager, I did everything that I can, but I couldn't get the three thousand dollars in lender credit. Um, but I was able to get $1,000 in lender credit, and so we can do this, this, and this, and this, and you reiterate all the benefits again. The problem with that is, though, is that number one, Jim was already expecting to go into negotiation unless you've been watching Sales Remastered and you know how to, how to, uh, you know, how to transition from interview to uh, to, to the actual pitch and then negotiation and then close. And so I got information on that. It's called the close. It's a, it's a digital, uh, closing course and, and sales training course. And I'll leave links below this video so you can, you can learn about that course, but it's going to effectively teach you how to transition. It's going to teach you how to market. It's going to teach you how to transition into a pitch. It's going to teach you how to negotiate that pitch if needed, but more importantly, how to close that pitch and how to deliver that pitch. And so it's all drawn out and link below to learn more about that information. But going back to the negotiation, that's the common response. And so I want you again to look at your own process from a third party, like you are looking in, you're watching it yourself, like kind of like an innocent bystander, right? And uh, <clears throat> and pay attention to how you react to things like, like you know, hearing a response of your exception or how you react to um, uh, that answer and then go into the engagement with the prospect. And so if you're starting your negotiation or if you're starting your pitch with the message of, hey, I couldn't get it, but this is what I got, the tonality of the rest of that message is settlement. And we're brought up to not want to settle. 
right? We're brought up to, to believe that, hey, I don't need to settle for this because I have options. And ultimately that influences the thought of, well, let me see what other options I can get. Let me see if, if this competitor can get me the full asking price. And so that ultimately will end up with, okay, well, let me think about it. And ultimately what that means is you're not going to hear back from them. But if I came across that answer and I had that same pitch scenario, you know, effectively, just as I lay out my course, you have to, again, prime before you go into a pitch or negotiation, you have to prime the prospect and remind them why they need you. So you have to remind them and take the focus away from the price, take it to focus away from the exception and simply remind them in black and white as to why you are going to uh, be their savior, right? Why you are going to help dramatically improve the quality of their life, how you're going to ensure that they have a great user experience. And so you may, you may frame the pitch or engagement and remind them as to why they need you. But ultimately, how you would start that answer is saying, "Hey, you know what? I had a, I had a, I just got out of meeting with my manager. We went over your file, and I was sharing with him how I'm going to be able to help you do A, B, and C. And again, that's the framing, right? And ultimately, what he did was he said, "Hey, if you can get um, the full file, it looks pretty clean, and it looks like we're helping Jim out a lot. So if you can go ahead and get it in, he's willing to knock off uh, five hundred dollars." of the actual settlement service. But here's the thing, Jim, is I have an idea. If you can get me these items by first thing tomorrow morning, right, like when you get home or maybe before you go home, print out your pay stubs, bring a W-2, um, my plan is to actually include your file with a lot of the other prospects that I'm working with within your area. And I'm going to ask him that, I'm, that I want to be able to kind of grow my brand. I want, I want to be able to grow my awareness. And I feel that the amount of benefit we're delivering to you will not only ensure that you remain a client for life, but you're likely to refer us to everyone else in the community and thus it'd be a win-win. And so my thought is this, and I want to run it by you. I believe I can deliver all of these benefits, but if you can get me your documents by tomorrow morning, I'm going to ask him for double the exception. And so instead of 500, I'll get you a thousand dollars in credit just to put towards this. But here's the thing is that I'm having a meeting with him tomorrow morning with regards to the prospects in your county or, you know, sell the story, but don't go into it saying, hey, man, I wasn't able to get the full pop, but I was only able to get this. You still have to position yourself. You know, if you've ever played poker, most in particularly like uh, like Texas Hold'em poker, the way to sell a soft hand, not to give hints that you have the strongest hand because you want people to keep putting in money, right? That's how you win. And so you may, you may sell uh, or give off the body language that you really have nothing. So you might be hesitant with your bets or you might overthink things and take a little bit longer, even knowing that you can literally lay down and beat every hand at that table with what you got. But it's all in the sale, right? That will kind of lure <laughs> the prey. Um, and I'm not saying your prospects are prey or anything, but what I am saying is take a few you know, pages from the books of, of, of poker and don't give your full cards away. You know, I think, I think one of the biggest mistakes that salesmen do is that they give too much information or they give it at a time where they, they shouldn't have. And so if the dealers, it hasn't even flipped over the flop yet or it's the first three cards, it's not like you're going to go all in yet, right? You're going to fill it out. You're going to fill the table. And really it's all about positioning. It's about positioning not only within yourself and, 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 and putting yourself in the right frame of mind to have enough confidence to still believe and sound and exude the message that, oh man, I got great news for you. Oh man, this is going to be awesome, right? But avoid exuding or, or alluding to the mess or I, how can I put it, displaying the message of like, oh man, we didn't get it, but here, this is what we got. Because instinctively, when prospects hear that tonality, they want the absolute best. And the reason why they want the best is because they're always being promised the best. This is marketing at its finest, right? You, you, imagine how many competitors, do you market that you don't have the best service? No, right? You market that you have the absolute best service. You market that you have the best fees, the best costs, the best rates, whatever it is, you could beat your competitor. This is the message. 
And so when 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 a consumer engages with one of the companies and they they feel the sense of oh they couldn't deliver on what everyone else is advertising, instinctively they're going to want to go check it out. But if you make the engagement feel like they're coming out on top, but more importantly put in that sense of urgency, kind of like what I was talking about before, sales uh, work well because it expires and so there's this FOMO effect that happens well the FOMO effect happens in everything that you want it to happen into and so like I was saying like hey I got an idea if you can give me these documents by first thing tomorrow I'm going to include your file in this meeting that I'm having with other homeowners or other clients in your area and I'm going to share with him that we've had so much pros uh, progress within that area I want to be the go-to person of that area I want I really want to put my name and make a household within your county and so in order to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to include your file and these others that I'm meeting about. Just like I met with him today, I'm going to share with him that I got a full file, got all your documents, and so we can move very quick. More importantly, I'm going to ask him for double the the exception, right? So now their perception is that not that oh you can't get the full pop. Their perception is that you're going to get me double. Oh man, yeah. Let me go ahead and react to that because I don't want half. I want I want two times the amount that, that you're quoting me. Who wouldn't react with more urgency, right? So it really does have to go with positioning. I, I know this message is rather long, but I hope that it resonates and I hope that it helps you position yourself to win today. And I'll see you on the next video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I do go through every single comment. I do reply back to all the comments and I appreciate the time that you've given to watching this video. I hope it helps. Bye. Why am I naked fool? Fresh out of